Well, we have a glide path and it's been verified, so we can come right in with the primary 2507 Wave 1 Gold instrument. I want to really emphasize multiple passes. The instrument should only work for about three or four millimeters and then it should be removed. There should be a lot of debris towards its working tip as it's sort of crowning down. So after every instrument's removed, we irrigate to kick out gross debris, take the tin file and recapitulate. That goes back to length and make sure we have our glide path and then we re-irrigate. Let this run in passively on the second pass. It'll move deeper into the glide path and it'll carry a shaping wave into the middle one third. And again, we don't peck, we brush. Don't peck, 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 brush. And again, irrigate, recapitulate, and then re-irrigate. These are critical steps that should never be overlooked between the use of any given shaping file. On the third pass, the instrument will travel through the body of the canal passively and then begin to work towards its apical extent in the apical one-third of the root. Notice how this instrument's loading up. Notice how flexible and how it can crawl around curvature and to length. Again, remove the instrument and irrigate, recapitulate, re-irrigate. Notice that the flutes are loaded with debris. This is a very clear method that can be taught internationally so clinicians know when is the shape done. So one of the things in finishing criteria is look at your file and if the file is loaded with debris in its terminal flutes, you have confidence that that file just cut its shape. On the other hand, you could use a 2502 Nitai hand file. We know that this instrument's 7% taper, so we know a 2% taper instrument will fit passively inside a 7% taper. The only thing a hand file has in common with a primary file is they're both a quarter of a millimeter at the tip. So if the 2502 is snug at length, that confirms the foramen is on the order of 25 hundredths. And if it's loose at length, it just means the foramen is greater than 25 hundredths, and that would suggest maybe moving to another technique. As we will see, there is a third method we can use for finishing criteria, and we'll look at that in just a moment, but that would be fitting a cone. Now, the cones traditionally could have never, ever been used as a finishing criteria, but with new innovations in gutta percha master cone manufacturing and with nanotechnology, we have a cone that has superior sizing and formulation. It's the first major improvement in gutta percha in probably almost a hundred years. They're three cents each, but they are superior in their sizing and formulation. And in fact, this really now allows us to use the word system-based endodontics because these cones, and over 99% of the time, you pull out your last shaping file and these cones will slide right to length. And if I'm wrong, they might go a millimeter long, which can simply be trimmed. I really think you would want to check these cones out. So to summarize what we've been talking about with a actual clinical case, we've talked about the importance of great access and then using a tin file in the presence of a viscous chelator to scout, catheterize, and secure canals. Well, then that canal can be shaped and it can be shaped on the order of somewhere around a 2507 to a 2508 and you can notice it's easy to then have enough shape to use a disinfection technology to move the irrigants into the uninstrumental portions of the root canal space. Also, shaping allows us to easily fit a cone. And that cone can be thermal softened and in the presence of sealer, you can carry a wave of warm gutta perch into the apical one-third and the obturation materials and out with the anatomy. And then looking at the post-operative film, uh, the old expression, the thrill of the fill. You can see the first bicuspid has three portals of exit, but the one we were showing in detailed steps on the left has probably eight portals of exit in its apical three millimeters.